Um, before we get started, I want to um, excuse Giovanna. Um, she is not able to join us today. Her sister just had a baby, so she's with her. Um, so she excuses herself um, for not being able to be here today. Um, so without further ado, welcome everybody to this Yale Science Academy Conversations with Scientists. Today we are going to be discussing the public, uh, the topic of publishing. Um, and so I would like to introduce our wonderful, wonderful panelists for today. We have three people that ha are researchers or have been researchers and are now in publishing and who have a variety of experiences with the peer um, review process and they'll be here today to share their experiences and advice with all of us. So first we have Dr. Rebecca Calisi Rodriguez. Let's see where are you Becca? I'm here. Hello there everyone. You Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So Becca studies how brain activity changes during parenthood and in response to stress. She is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology, Physiology, Ed, and Behavior at the University of California, Davis. Um, her research interests include vertebrate reproductive neuroendocrinology, animal behavior, genomics, and environmental health. And she uses pigeons to do her research, which I think is super, super cool. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Daniel Colon Ramos, who is a professor at Yale University. Daniel, where are you? Okay. Here. Okay. <laughs> Ahí está Daniel. Um, so Daniel uses C. elegans, which is my favorite model organism, not because I used it in grad school, has nothing to do with that. Um, and his lab is interested in how synapses are assembled to build the neuronal architecture that underlies behavior. Um, some of you have probably heard about Daniel because he is the founder of, of Ciencia Puerto Rico and he does many other wonderful things um, related to science in Puerto Rico. So welcome, Daniel. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, we have Dr. Masha Gelfand, who is a scientific editor at Developmental Cell, where she reads a wide variety of cell and developmental biology. Um, she also travels to meet scientists from across the world. Um, and she shepherds them through the uh, publication process. So Masha is a developmental biologist by training. We actually know each other from graduate school. Um, Masha, I, I can't see you. Are you. Oh, right here. There you are. Yeah. Um, so we know each other from grad school because we both went to Harvard. Um, so thank you. Masha, Becca, and Daniel for, for joining us today. We are super happy to, to have you and we're eager to start our conversation. So I am gonna ask our discussants to take it away and start us with questions. Um, hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so my first question will be um, how to identify the right journal and what factors to consider when selecting this journal. Um, let's see, I'll have, Masha, do you wanna go? Yeah, sure, I mean, it, it's sort of a personal preference, you know, you know the journals you like to read and um, what kind of stuff is published in that journal. So um, if you have a favorite journal based on scope, you, you can choose to submit to that journal. Um, I mean, if you think you're, if you think it's you've discovered something completely amazing and unheard of then you can go to something that's very wide ranging in scope um it's really a matter of preference and knowing what journals you like to read and what they publish becca uh, i would have to say that if you are uh writing up your paper and you're referencing a lot of um uh, papers from a specific journal, that might be one clue to key you into where a good fit for your paper might be. 
Um, so that's, that's generally one. There's usually a handful of, of journals that uh, uh, will be well known in your field. So that's another place to look. And then uh, when in doubt, when you're just starting out, I think it's always good to ask a mentor or, or a more established um, co-author uh, for some suggestions. Daniel. Yeah, I, I have little to add. Essentially, I, I don't think there are hard rules about how to pick a journal. I will say that the assumption is that in all journals, there's, you know, your study for all journals should be rigorous and should be correct. And the difference is how, how broad of an audience should hear about this discovery. So the, the, more, um, the more detailed the discovery, then the more, the more focused the journal should be because there's gonna be a very focused audience that will be interested. And if the discovery is something that affects a lot of diff uh, different disciplines, so it's a very fundamental discovery that affects across disciplines, then you wanna go to a broader journal and those journals tend to be what are considered the higher impact journals because they're, you know, they're more papers that think that they apply for a lot of different fields, so they have to be more selective in their publication. But in, in reality, I mean, I think this mattered a lot when people, you know, when there was a subscription-based system in which, you know, people would get one or two magazines and there were more people that were subscribed to a given magazine than others. So you subscribe to, to, to three or four magazines and, and, and depending where, where you publish, more people will read you. But now with the internet, that becomes, you know, it becomes a, kind of like a softer type of, type of thing. Like it's, because you can find any article on it now. Can I add something to that too, Monica? Is that okay to just chime in? Yes. Of you course. said there was a hand raising thing. I don't see it. Do I have one? A hand raising option? Uh oh, I don't hear you. Does everyone else hear her but me? Oh, wait. Sorry. I was muted. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it works like this. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, now, I mean, but feel, feel free easier. to. Feel free to chime in. I can't find, let's see, it's, I can't find it right now. Okay. I, I, yeah, I just feel free to chime in. Version there. Um, I would have to say also since, to, to piggyback on what Daniel said, that um, now that we have many more options because of the internet, um, something to be considering too is the open access policy of the journal. Um, and uh, I know that, you know, obviously there's some journals that are open access and then there's some, some other journals that you can pay extra for an open access policy. And I think making sure that your science and your, your discoveries are available for all is, is uh, really important to um, include a lot more people than, than the usual ones that are um, able to access this information. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Becca. Um, next question. And, and okay, this is sorry, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Christina. Um, so my question is, have you ever disagreed with comments or suggestions that were made by reviewers? And if you have, what do you do when this happens? And please provide examples. I never have, ever. Never. <laughs> That's impossible. Daniel, do you want? Oh, I think you're frozen. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, you always, you know, you're gonna have disagreements with people, uh, particularly when it comes to something you think very carefully about, which, which is your science, and if you know if there's a critique on your science and you've been thinking about it for years, then usually <clears throat> the first reaction is to, to uh, have a second thought or a disagreement with that, with that, uh, with that person. It's, that's pretty common. I think, I mean, my approach to it is that I, 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 I try to take the, the criticism constructively. So I, I make an assumption that this is coming from a place of, 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 you know, of another colleague that has taken time to read my article and, and is actually interested in the science being better. So that's, that's my departing point. And then I try to interpret it through that. And I, 
uh, I usually take a couple of days just to think about the critiques and I, I try not to react. So I just, you know, um, the, the reaction to critiques, particularly for something that you've been working on very hard, like articles that take years, it's, uh, it's you know, you have to be a saint not to have like a negative reaction. You have, you're have you gonna have some sort of negative reaction. So you, you what you wanna make sure is that you go through that phase and then you move on to a, a constructive space where you can actually think about the content of the criticism. And the, once you think about the content of the criticism, you might, you might find that, that the critique has either a valid point or not, and then you have to argue it. So if it has a valid point, then you should address it experimentally or integrate it into the manuscript. And if it doesn't, or if it's asking for something that's kind of beyond the scope of the article or something that's technically not possible, then, then, then that, that leads to kind of like a rebuttal. Like there's a letter that you have to write to the journal when you make your experiments and explain what experiments you did to address what. And in, in, in that letter, you can explain to the, both the editor and the reviewer politely what your viewpoint is on those critics that were made. So that's, that's usually how I handle it. Can I just say, so as, as an editor who um, I'm on the receiving end of all of the rebuttals, um, I do have to agree, I think waiting a couple days and thinking about it is great advice. The rebuttals that I get within, you know, an hour of rejecting a paper are never constructive. Um, so, um, I mean, I, everybody, everybody gets critiques they don't agree with to some extent. And um, it's, it's your job to figure out whether it's within the scope of your paper whether the comments make sense and whether it's within the scope to actually address them. And oftentimes there is a venue for you to discuss that with either the editor or the reviewers themselves um, via the editor or the journal. So I suggest that if there's a, that kind of possibility and you have very strong opinions, you, you should take that opportunity. It's there for you to use it. Yeah, Priscilla, I see your hand raised, but I have a, I wanted to follow up on, on Masha's point. And I wanted to actually ask you, Masha, like, what should, um, what should the scientists expect from you as, as an editor? Because you say like you're on the receiving end, obviously you're like, you're dealing with the reviews and you're that point person between the, the scientists who's submitting a paper and, and the people we're reviewing. And so you're receiving all of, all of this information. So is your role more as a mediator? So what should the scientists submitting a paper expect you to do or not do as, as the editor? Sure, I mean, it's, it's a little hard to answer because it's very case specific. Um, I mean, my role is to be definitely more than just a pass through of comments from one side to the other, right? If it was just a pass through role, I wouldn't really need to exist. So my role is to synthesize the comments that I get from reviewers, um, hopefully make a coherent decision, and then to keep that in mind when I get rebuttals from authors. Um, and I quite often will email reviewers um, to ask, you know, you you said this is important. Do you really think it's that important or do you think it would be enough if the authors did X or Y? Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm there for the paper and whether that involves discussing with the authors or the reviewers, that's, that's all part of my job. Great, thank you. Um, Priscilla, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Priscilla, and uh, my question is, at what point in the writing process do you start thinking about which journal you want to submit your publication to? And specifically, um, um, since we have an editor here, maybe you can tell us if you, at what point in the writing process um, do scientists reach out to you, and when do you think it's better to, to reach out to you and, and start thinking about the journals? So I, I guess I can go first if you, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, lots of people will just email the whole paper and right? so that's, that's probably, you know, you've already written it. You're, you're just sending me the whole paper. That's fine. Then I read the whole paper. Um, many people email what's called a pre-submission inquiry. So that's a short description of the paper and just say, um, here are my findings. What do you think? Would you want to see this? And would you, do you think this is appropriate for the journal? Um, 
and that can be very helpful um, because it is abbreviated. It's a little bit, you know, it depends how well you can really summarize the, ex the exciting nature of your results, how helpful that is. That's, that's my opinion as editor. So oftentimes when I get a pre-submission inquiry, I just like, I can't really tell what's in there. And then my answer is of not very helpful, send the paper in and I can read it. So that's not really that helpful. But oftentimes if you say I have this finding, what do you think? I can say, you know, that seems appropriate for the journal or not. Does that answer your question? Yeah, Danielle and Becca, do you want to comment on, on um, Priscilla's question? Like when, as you're writing the paper, like what point do you decide where you're going to send it? Like, I know that I've, I've met people that are like, oh, I'm going to write this paper in the style of X journal because they only take X amount of figures and the paper can be these many pages long. Um, like I know I've, I've seen people do that, but. Um, Sorry, can I just jump in really yeah, quick? Don't yeah. get paranoid about your formatting and your figure numbers when you submit a paper. It's not pub being published yet. Just Yeah, yeah, but I, I have heard, I've, I've heard people say that. So there's an example of things you shouldn't do. Um, so how do you approach that, um, Daniel and, and Becca? in your writing process? All right, uh, I'll go ahead and, and go. For me, it, it's, uh, I wish I could say that I had a specific process, but I think each um, experiment uh, and, and each thing that a student produces in the lab or a postdoc produces has a, um, is a little different. So sometimes when we're asking a really big question and we start to see results that are, are really exciting, then we automatically start thinking of more high impact journals, journals that would reach a, a broader audience. Um, but if that's not the case and it's still just, you know, it's good science and a good contribution, then um, for example, with my graduate students, I ask them to write a proposal more or less before they even begin uh, and then fill it in and we check in you know each week or each month on it and then it starts to get it starts to carve out a life of its own and then we try to figure out what the best fit uh, for a journal would be for it so i think for us we let the science speak for itself and then later on pick the journal and not the other way around we're going to write um, for this specific journal I, I agree with Becca. <clears throat> I, let me see, the most useful piece of advice I can give about paper writing is to start writing like these ants, and you go back and you make an outline of like how is your paper going to look like? And it's going to be, can you guys hear me? It says internet unstable, so I don't know if I, yeah, it's a little, can you hear it's me? It's a little choppy, but yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Well, I was saying that the, the most useful piece of advice I can give is to start writing the paper immediately. And by that, I mean, make an outline of your paper. It's going to be fluid. It's going to change. But just start thinking about how that paper is going to look like because it's going to help you focus on the experiment. So the process of paper writing, in my mind, is not separated from the process of discovery. It, it is kind of separated from the process of submission. So once we're submitting, it's a whole other thing. Like once we have the paper finished, then we just kind of look at it, we read it, we give it to a few people, we get comments and opinions, and then, and then which journal it goes to var depends on a lot of things. It depends on how fast we want to get it out there. It depends on the audience that we want to talk to. It depends on how soon we want to publish it, how we make. So I see that as a model and frankly not the most important part of the process so for me the most important part of the process is actually having having that outline very early on which is gonna many times but it's a structure over which you can prioritize what are the important questions and which are the important experiments too great um next question Um, I have a question. So I guess it's kind of related um, and it's kind of vague, but, you know, as graduate students, um, how many papers, I, so different programs have different standards for their students, but 
you know, if you want to keep in the track of academia, how many first or second author's papers should a graduate student have? And how important is it the impact factor of the journal it's published in? In order to like, I guess, like be successful in your career. What, what's the goal? What's successful? Like, I mean, like to stay in academia to, to, I guess, like feel like you're being competitive in the realm of academia if you want to like wind up being a professor in the future. Do you want to go ahead, Becca? I don't like going first. <laughs> okay, I, I'll go, I'll go. Okay. So, so um, okay, so uh, let me see. I, I, will, I will actually reframe it a little bit different, the, the, the way I, I will think about it. So ca counting papers or counting impact factors. Coffee. Becca, it looks like you may have to oh, go. Oh, <laughs> no, he's, he's departing with them. I want to hear what he's going to say. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, um, okay, so, so are you thinking that you want the next step to be a postdoc? Is that yeah, right? I mean, probably, right. Probably a postdoc. Um, and we're all in um, science fields here, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, so, bi biomedical uh, behavioral sciences, so yeah. Right, right. So um, some people end up uh, writing a lot of their, their papers after they submit their dissertation. And, and that's great because then, you know, you, you graduate and then it's boom, 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 boom. You have all these papers um, that come out one after the other. But what I've noticed, it's very helpful if you try to get those papers out during your, um, during your time in graduate school because it does help show your potential postdoc advisor or, or fellowship um, grantors that uh, you are productive because that's you know one huge way we measure productivity if you want to stay in academia. So I would um, suggest that you, uh, instead of doing what feels natural and waiting until the end <laughs> to, to put out all this research is to really um, push yourself to try to get you know at least a couple publications out and you know that's that's just someone could get a science paper out and then get you know 10 uh, small specific journal papers out and it really just depends what the funding agency is interested in what your postdoc advisor is interested in so um, I think you just do the best you do the best you can with what you have but if you want to talk about the timeline of publication I would encourage from my perspective to get out papers soon before you start applying for postdocs and postdoctoral fellowships. So maybe like having papers out rather than like oh like where is is it like where are you publishing is more important? Um, I don't know if it's maybe you're publishing at all. I guess should be the priority. I think publishing is, is definitely important. Um, it's hard to, to not have your, uh, you know, your, your CV and, and your academic, you know, your, your projects in front of me to make a, a specific yeah, yeah. Um, recommendation. But uh, if you have something that you think is going to be a little bit more impactful, if you, if you hold off a little bit, I mean, that's, that's kind of the decision we all have to make no matter what level that we're at. Um, you know, science moves fast and it's, uh, you know, do you want to be that person that puts out that one or two big papers a year or do you want to put out 10 medium sized papers a year? These are all important contributions. Just how you put them out is a matter of personal preference and also a matter of what is um, valued the most by your department or your supervisor. Thank you. Daniel, are you back? Uh, I'm sorry I got cut off. If I get cut off again, I'm just going to call on the phone so okay. that I can, I can come through. So I, I was saying that I think, okay, so for grad school, I will think about it a little bit differently than, than other stages, like for the postdoc or even for faculty members. For grad school, I think simple company, you learn. Are you guys hearing me? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> It's it's cutting off. Why don't you try turning off? Okay, let, let, I'm gonna I'm gonna call you on my phone. I'm get, gonna get my phone and then I'm gonna answer this question. Okay. Do you have the number? I don't know if I sent it to you. Yeah. Why don't you send it to me in the chat? I'm gonna leave the video on, but I'm just gonna use the phone to talk. 
I'm okay. not, but I need to get it. I'm gonna go and get it. Give me All right. One second. Okay. Um, while he goes, gets his phone. Um, Masha, do you have any thoughts on on this? I mean, I, I don't really because I'm not, you know, I'm not making any decisions with regards to people's careers. Um, mm -hmm. I would say from my graduate school experience and the experience of all my classmates applying for postdocs and other jobs, it matters. This is based totally anecdotally. I have no idea if it's true across fields. It matters to academics that your paper is published soon after you graduate or when you graduate and for other things, it doesn't really matter. I'm getting the phone number, Daniel. Marcos, you had your hand up. Why don't you go ahead and, and share your comment? Hi, everyone. Um, I have a really kind of tricky question, but I have been reading a lot about this mega journals and there are some opinions about that mega journals are like the future of publishing. And some other experts have other positions about mega journals, so I want to hear your position about that. What do you mean by me mega journals? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah mega journals are what this, do you mean by that? like big journals like um, Plus One that can publish like thousands of articles a year um, versus these journals that are like printed journals that they just have, cannot have that kind of impact regarding the number of papers they publish. So kind of the researchers are moving into mega journals so for, for submitting their papers because also they reach a broad out audience that way, but it's kind of a divided opinion between experts. So I just want to hear a bit about that. If you encourage also using this kind of journals for, for publishing or more specific journals, if you have some thoughts about it. So I had to look up what you meant by mega journal. I had never heard of it described that way, but it's very, it's, it's clearly a thing. Um, I always think of them as uh, open access type journals like plus one. Uh, and I, I have, I have mixed views. I think it's for one thing, wonderful. I think it's wonderful science available for all um, the, the publishing process can take a really, really long time. Now I hear though plus one <laughs> takes a long time. I'm not sure I haven't submitted there in, in a while, but um, I think they're good, but I think a big critique is that uh, there's, that there's a lot of crap that comes out of them too. <laughs> uh, so you might not um, get maybe the best reviewers or the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable editors to find the best reviewers. And um, it's a little bit more risky in that regard. However, um, there's really, really great science that, that comes out in them as well. So uh, it's just an incredible, incredible variation. But, uh, you know, if people know you, they know your work, um, they're familiar with the topic, uh, then, then generally they find your paper and, and, you know, I cite plenty of stuff from places like plus one. Mm. Well, I know that's not really a concrete answer, but I think it, it's a, it's a complicated issue. And I, I bet Masha has a lot of thoughts on it. I mean, I don't really have thoughts that are that different from yours. I, th I think the things that, the thing that's good is there's lots of science. The thing that's bad is there's lots of science. So, you know, there's lots of good, there's lots of bad. I would say um, I, I haven't myself submitted to one of those journals and I haven't talked to anyone who works at one of those journals, but I would predict that they have a very high workload. So I don't know what kind of attention your paper will get there versus a journal that gets fewer submissions. So I'm not sure I have anything to add to what um, Becca is saying. Okay. Um, I think Daniel is on the phone. Daniel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you okay. hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. So um, I actually, I, go ahead. I, I wanted to finish <laughs> what I tried to answer twice now. So uh, I, and I wanted to take a step back from the journals and just kind of think about the science a little bit and the articles, which I think is, it's, you know, t talking about the journal, I think I mean, the conversation of the journals is important and there's all this mystique around the journals and how do you navigate the journal system, et cetera. 
but it's a little bit like putting the car in front of the horses to talk about the journals without talking about the science. So I want to start by, like, I just want to make sure that all 30 some participants here have an idea of how you start writing a scientific paper. Because if you don't know how you start writing a scientific paper, if you still think that the first part that you write when you're writing a scientific paper is the title, and then after that is the abstract, and then after that is the introduction, that's the conversation we should be having tonight about how is it that you put together a piece of scholarship. And then from there, like I think going back to Gabby's question uh, a few minutes ago, I, how many papers are necessary from grad school? I think uh, the problem with phrasing the question, I, I, I think it's an important question, okay? But I, but I also think that the, the problem with phrasing the question that way, and that's, uh, that's it's a conversation that needs to be had, but, it, but the problem with just thinking about that is that the, uh, it, it becomes a, in, into an exercise of bean counting. You know, you're like counting beans, like like one bean, two beans, three beans, and that's not what scientific scholarship is about, and it's not what training science uh, should be about either. So in grad school, I will encourage all graduate students to think instead about what are the skills that you need to be gaining right now to be able to quote unquote independently, and by independently I mean relatively on your own, although there's nothing that's completely independent in life, but you know, relatively on your own, be able to navigate the process of putting together a paper. That is the most important thing. So if that takes one paper or two papers or three papers, then you know, that the, the, the priority should be for you to leave grad school knowing how to put a paper out there. And the difference between one and zero is infinity. So the difference between not publishing and publishing your first paper it's infinite. By the time that you apply for faculty positions, the, you know, faculty, I've been in about 10 search committees here at Yale, and, you know, the candidates who have published by the time they apply to faculty positions, I don't know, like maybe three, four, five, maybe six papers if the candidate has been super productive. So that, but we're not, no one sits down and counts the paper and says, oh, this candidate is really good because they have six papers versus this one has three papers. No one does that in a faculty search. What they're looking at is, is this person working on an exciting question that is worth like us investing in? And do they have the skills to be able to do that? And for you to be able to position yourself to, to achieve those things in your postdoc, like if you now you do like a backtracking and see what do I need now to be able to get there? then it's not the number of papers, it's knowing at this stage in your career how to write a paper, so that then in the next stage, you can actually focus on what you want to work on, particularly, you know, hopefully as an independent academic scientist, and having had the skills of how, how to write a paper, then you can actually navigate that other part of putting the scholarship out there much easier. So that, that, that's how I will frame it. I'm glad that I got on the phone because of the system crashing between you. <laughs> you froze. So hopefully you guys heard it. Yeah, no, that was that was great. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add, Becca or Masha? Okay. Um, so I don't know if you heard Marco's question about mega journals, which is also the first time I hear um, mega journals. So. Um, I think he was referring to um, open access journals um, and, and, you know, this, um, your thoughts on open access journals, whether to publish on, in them or not, like journals, for the example that was offered was um, PLOS One. Uh, can, I, can I just jump in really quick? Yes, so open access, it, it's sort of, it's, they overlap, but it's not the same. Open access me just means you don't have to have a subscription. Your institution doesn't have to have a subscription. Mm -hmm. so there are plenty of open access journals that aren't, you know, mega journals, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so and what are mega journals? I'm still, I'm still confused. Um, I mean, I think, After I think the student is asking about some, you know, journal like Plus One that just publishes volume. Mm, okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Whoever asked the question. Ah, I see. Marcus well, just sent me a link. I've, I've heard the term like, I haven't heard this term mega journals, but I've heard the term predatory journals and things like that. Like I, look, I think um, there are some journals out there that have a business model of just 
charging to publish. They have they, they take advantage of the system. Like they they come across as open access journals, but they charge a lot to be for you to get your article out, and they have good review systems. And so they they refer to as predatory journals. Um, I I think they're relatively. I think the websites out there that call them out. They're relatively easy to spot, but I, but those journals aside. The the journal doesn't make the article, so the article is what it is. So if it's if, you know if it's a good piece of scholarship and you're putting it out and it's in plus one, like I just to just to give an example, the the theory I think it's, it was the theory behind the Higgs boson was actually put out in as a paper in archives in physics. It was actually never published in a peer review uh, uh, journal. So. Different communities have different journals that they prioritize, different ways in which they evaluate the work. Uh, the journal is going to help you get visibility for the article, but if your journal, if the scholarship is, is crappy, it, it doesn't matter what journal you put it in, it's going to suck. And if the scholarship is good, maybe you'll have more visibility, a little bit more visibility in one journal, a little bit less in another, but it's part of, of a much bigger visibility factor that has to do with, you know, who sides your paper, what conferences you presented in, like how well you explain it, how clearly it's written, et cetera, that it might help a little bit, but it's not gonna it's not gonna do miracles for your for your science. At the end of the day, what really, really matters is the science. That's my opinion. Great. Um thank you for, for clarifying um that and, and thank you for your answers. Um I wanna so First of all, um, I'll invite everybody to think about your questions um, and, and please, please, please ask. But before we move on, I wanted to actually come back to something that, that Danielle uh, mentioned. And I, I wanted to ask each of the panelists to, to give us um, their take on this. Um, and it was the question is, how do you put a paper together? Um, I think that's, it seems like a very basic basic question, um, but it's one that I know as I as a graduate student had a lot of issues with, had a lot of misconceptions about the process. Um, I mean, I mentioned earlier that I saw people, like I saw people in not my my graduate lab, but in the lab that I were was before, I saw people writing papers and they were like, I'm writing this paper for science. And like at that point in my life, I was like, well, that's how you write a paper. You say, I want to write for this journal and I want, to, I want it published in this journal and you just wrote it with the format for that, for that paper. So I think there's a lot of, of, of misconceptions um, and of course there's a lot of approaches to, to doing this, but um, for Daniel and Becca, as, um, as faculty, when you're working with graduate students, how do you go about teaching your graduate students how to put together a paper? Um, you know, we've talked about this is one of the things that when you graduate um, you're with your PhD, this is something that you should know how to do, um, not just because that's part of graduate school, but it's part of becoming an independent scientist. Um, and so, you know, I, I like, I'll, and I'll ask Danielle to go first. Uh, <laughs> so, Danielle, how do, you, um, how do you put a paper together? Like, how do you approach this with your students? Yeah, I, I I just typed this in the chat the first three uh, three steps that I asked the graduate students. So can you can you the, can you say them out loud? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. The the first thing that I that I try to do is I ask them what is the one message of your paper in the form of a title. Like what is, and then if the grad student usually you can tell if they understand the importance of the project just based on the title. If the title is something technical like Green fluorescent protein attached to synaptic molecule in this neuron moves to this place, and you know they're not understanding the importance of the of the work. Give me one second, my kids are The uh, second thing is so so that's the first step. Like it should be one message. The other thing that is usually a problem is if the message is compounded. If it's like this and that, and also this other interesting thing I saw, and also this other interesting thing I saw, then and you, sit, you can tell that they're maybe working on different projects, or they're working on one project, but they're not linking the different themes together yet. So that, that is the first 
part, like understanding what is going to be the message. Now, the message might, it's going to change. It's going to change with the data. But understanding what the message is at any given point in the project is important to understand how the message is changing with the data. So if you're not aware of that, then, then you're not going to be able to make progress towards putting the paper together because you're not, you don't know which way you're going. And it's going to be also hard to prioritize on which experiments you should be focusing on because you don't know which ones are going to be key for the paper because you're not thinking of them in the context of the paper. So that is the first thing, the, 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 the title or the main message of what the paper is going to be. Understanding that it's going to be fluid and it's going to change, but that you always should be aware of what it is. Then the second part that I do is once that's understood, then I say, okay, let's write an outline. Uh, let's write an outline of anywhere between four to eight figures. Usually students, when they're starting, they can probably outline three, four figures, and that's great. And those figures are going to also change. But then when they do those figures, those outline, like figure one should have, each figure should have a sub-message, a subtext to the main message. So if the main message is, I discover X, then figure one is the system. Figure two is the main discovery. Figure three is the supporting discovery. Figure four is a manipulation of the discovery showing that it actually works the way you think it works, something like that. And then, so they, so I ask them to make that outline. And then once that outline, it, you know, it, it, once we discuss that outline and it's more settled as we're approaching publication, the final step when we start, before we start writing in earnest is figure formatting. So I just ask them to, to make the figures. So they, they make the figures and then we discuss the figures, we go through the data, we see how, you know, and, and usually by that point, the student can very clearly tell where the holes are because they, they have been thinking about it deep enough. They can, they can but if they, haven't, if they haven't done that exercise, there's no way that out of the blue, they're gonna be able to tell where the holes in the research is. It's just too hard. So, so once you have the figures, then the next steps are, are pretty straightforward because the, the next part is to write the results section. And the results section is just walking through the figures. Like if you have the figures right in the results section, it will take, I don't know, maybe, maybe a couple of days. But you go out, you go, if you know what you're doing, you can even do it in a couple of hours in an afternoon, like just like the first class, because you're just like telling them what is in the figure. You write the results section, then you write the figure legends, you write the, you know, you can write the materials and methods when you're tired, or the acknowledgement or sections like that. And then the last sections that we write are uh, the uh, discussion, we write it after the results, then we write the introduction, and then we write the abstract at the very end. And the discussion, it helps us take the results and kind of project them towards what they mean. And the introduction helps us go backwards and look at the literature and frame our findings in the literature. And then there, we write it towards the end because we want to, how you frame the project is going to depend on which figures you put in there. There's not, like, this, this is hard to grasp if you haven't written a paper, but there's not a one way to write a paper. You can, you can give five figures to, actually, I took a, one of the best classes I took in grad school was, a class where this guy will come and he will take figures from a paper and he will cut them up and he we you know he will cross out which figure it was and he will just give them to us and ask us to order it at the paper and that so different people will order it differently they will put with what figure what figure five as figure one what was figure one as figure four and they will have different messages they will have and not because the data is different but because the points of emphasis are different so if Depending on your point of emphasis, you're gonna write a, a different introduction. So that's why that we write that at the very end. And that's, that's essentially what we do. How about you, Becca? How do you approach it? Um, so I mentioned a little bit before that what I, what I like is for, um, well, everything has to start with a good idea, right? So usually what happens is my students or postdocs, we come in, we come into my office and we use the big board behind me and we start storyboarding our ideas. And we go back and forth a lot, and that's one of my favorite. That's one of my favorite parts. What are what are the puzzles that we have to solve? So then, once we uh, deem an idea good, and of course, this doesn't just happen in one meeting. This is something that has, you know, been inspired by a previous discovery or grant, or you know. But once we decide on the idea, then what I have them do, mostly the grad students, not not so much the postdocs. Usually, the postdocs have. Um, maybe their own methods and, and I help to, to uh, support them. 
in that. But with the grad students, I have them write a proposal for me. And this is not a waste of time. I mean, it's always good to, to work on writing a proposal, but it's uh, essentially an argument to convince me why this is novel, why this is important, um, you know, what the message will be. And uh, then once they, once, you know, I'm convinced and I'm convinced that they know why it's important, that's when we begin. And during this time, I'm usually, you know, filing my, you know, Iacook, you know, the, the, the stuff you need to work with animals and getting things, ordering things um, with them. But uh, yeah, then, then they start. And then hopefully, as we go through, sections start to get refined. So your methods start to get refined. Um, uh, you know, then you have results. And then what happens is the introduction was already kind of there because you had to, you know, write a proposal and tell me why it was important. But these things, of course, change dramatically. Um, what ends up being really important, and I'll echo Danielle, are, are the figures. Uh, for us, the figures are really important to try to sketch out what we want our figures to be, how we're going to get them, um, you know, what, what statistics will we use, uh, you know, what experiments are, are the best uh, uh, and have the, the you know, strongest inference and so on and so forth. But I really do feel that the, the figure should tell a story and uh, I look back at some of my older work and cringe. I, I never want to read my old papers. I don't know if any, any of you guys feel like that, at least the oldest ones. But, um, uh, you know, I learn too as I go. So the figures, I think, are, are a really important part. And I once had a mentor uh, open up a paper for me and, and say, look, let's make sure we can tell the story by the figures in here. And that's just, that's really stuck with me. So something I do that is completely um, contradictory to what I've been taught in the past and to what Danielle just said, so, so I, I understand that, is that when I'm writing papers, it helps me to start with the abstract. Um, I love the idea of the title because I think what's happening for me and my process is that I, I'm doing that in the abstract. I'm really showing myself um, what is important and what is the message I want to get across. So I always write the abstract first and give it the most weight. Um, but that, of course, also changes a lot as the as the experiment goes on. So I think in the end, what happens is that it's good to try a lot of things. Um, but you're going to find your own way because writing a paper and communicating science to various audiences is like, it's like a form of art and it's unique to, uh, to each person. So I think feel out a lot of things, try a lot of things, and you'll start to feel what works best for you. I would say the one thing I have to add to that is once you're done writing your paper, I think it helps to give it to a lot of people to read and it helps to give it to people who are not, who are sort of in your field, but not, don't do directly what you do. So they will understand the science and principle, but not have looked at it many, many times. So oftentimes I think giving it to people in your own lab is valuable. And of course you'll do that, but since they already know what you're talking about, they can sort of maybe ignore problems that are there in the writing. Um, whereas other people in your department, for example, will point that out immediately. Yeah, that's gr that's great advice, Masha. Are there any other elements, like from from the perspective, you know, as an editor now, are there any other elements um, for that people need to consider when putting together their papers? Um, I mean, I th I think uh, Becca and Danielle did a great job describing how one would write a paper. I would say a very natural inclination that people have before they start actually writing it is to write it in sort of a chronological order of how you how you started doing the experiments. And oftentimes that doesn't actually make sense for the story. So um, don't automatically start writing it with, you know, the first thing you did in grad school leading up to, the, you know, the day you graduate. Yes, and I think that brings together the advice that all of you have offered. And, and you said it, like, it's a story. You know, when you're writing a paper, it's a story. It's not like a chronological recount of this is what I did and then I did this and then I did that because that's not how science necessarily works. Like, you know, it doesn't work in order. Like sometimes 
the the experiment that really breaks your project or like makes your project is is you know it's it's a random experiment and it's like something you didn't expect or you didn't you did it because i don't know something else um and so i think that's something that is that is really really important um to think about it as as a story and as you've heard from from our panelists and um, you know, for, for those of you who are looking at the chat, so in the chat, like people have said like, oh, I like to write the methods first because that's easy and it gets me in the, in the flow and the, of, of writing, or I like to have my title first because then it feels real and it gives me motivation. So obviously people have um, different styles of writing and then getting into into the flow of, of writing um, but I think what's really important is is the process you know it's the process of, of distilling an idea of the process of of really thinking intentionally and thoroughly how you want to tell the story how you want to tell the message not just with what you write but obviously with with the figure several people have mentioned in the chat that you know a good paper you should look at the uh, the figures and you should get it um and so what you write first it's probably going to be a matter of, of personal preference like sometimes you're in a block and you're like i'm going to write the methods because i know exactly what i did i put you know three grams of this and four grams of that and as this much water or liquid into my solution and you know that's easy to write um, but I think what's really, really important um, is is the process of, of really thinking about how you're going to tell um, this this story. Um, let's see, Marcos, you have your hand up. Go ahead. I have a question here. I'm kind of uh, writing something right now, and I'm in this debate if this data that I have should be a short communication, brief communication, or should I just kind of expand that work and then transform that into a whole paper with more than four figures? So I have been looking for some um, from journals that really accept right now short communication. So it's kind of a few words and just three to four figures. So you have any opinions of what should I do any any advising on that? Uh, is your is the data um, uh, is it in in fact a short communication or is this just one small part of a, a larger project? No, it, it really is a short communication. It's just a, a like. A, different kind of expression system for proteins that I just described and I want to just put it out there that if this is a way to produce this protein and you can use that protein eventually for whatever you want. So that's kind of a side project that I have and I just wanted to put it out there but I just don't want or they have like the time to do it full time because I'm working on my in my thesis project. So I, mean, I don't know what to do in, the, in that regard. I think that if, uh, if you get everything that you want to convey or everything that's important within the small space of a brief communication, I think that's wonderful. I think that you shouldn't ever feel like you have to be you know, verbose or fill a really, really big space. Um, I, love, I love short communications, the brief communications, because they're easy to read and I like, I like to you know, get, them, get them done and out of the way, all right? Guilty. Um, so I'm a big fan of them, but I really think that your data and how much information um, that, that you feel is, is necessary to convey should direct whether or not you do a certain um, uh, amount of words, certain word choice or amount of figures. I, I, you know, I think that's a question that we all wrestle with, right? When when to publish this story, and I think it it's hard to give like a one size fits all type of advice. It's like a more like a what they call like a Goldilocks type of situation where you, you know it has to fit just right. And what that means is it depends on what stage you are in your career. It depends what are the other priorities for you because. I guess the most useful piece of advice that I can offer about that is that if you write a short paper or, or if you write if you write a short descriptive paper, if you write a short 
paper, it's, you know, like the one pager of the double helix, the writing of the paper, the preparing of the paper takes all the same amount of time. But one of them is going to be, you know, very transformative, and the other one is going to be less. So, and so, it, so it's the so there's an element of opportunity cost to consider. Okay, so I will say this: if this is your first experience writing a paper, invaluable. If you're going from zero to one, fantastic. Do it. Like it's a great experience. You get your feet wet. It, like talk to your advisor. I will encourage uh, unless your advisor tells you otherwise because they have other plans. I will encourage. Yes, I think that's a good idea. If if writing that paper means that it's gonna distract you from a bigger project that you need to finish or something like that, then you know that's a different consideration because then there's an opportunity cost there because it will take time. There's no like people talk about quick papers. I have never written a quick paper ever because you write the paper, you send it out. It, it goes for peer review, it comes back, they ask for new things. Like a quick paper is a six month paper. That's not quick. So that, that so that, that that is the consideration. So no right answer, it depends on your on your particular situation. Thank you. Um Gabriela. Um, so I guess it's another like kind of broad question, but I guess like in the position of the first or second year graduate student um, who maybe like, I guess like publishing is like something that's not near or like, uh huh. So I guess what are steps or are there any steps that you can start taking to like kind of prepare for that future or like, you know, eventually having to publish? So is there anything that you can be doing now with your experiments or how you're organizing things? Like, I guess, what are you guys' experience with your own graduate students and what advice would you give? I, I, didn't, okay, quite, take... I didn't quite understand what you were asking. I'm sorry, could you, I didn't understand what you were asking. Yeah, just like, um, I don't, like having your own graduate students and for example, in a position where I'm not like going to publish anytime soon because I just started in the lab, are there any tips or suggestions that you would give your students to kind of like start preparing or like, I guess, ways that they can organize themselves or like approach experiments like that will, I guess, have them better prepared for when the time comes. I can take a stab. I yes, I I think so. I I will. At any stage, I think you should be aware of what you're working on. So at the very least, you can talk about. Uh, and I think I think actually Becca and I were talking about the same thing. I call it writing the title. She calls it writing the abstract. But it's essentially what is the concept that you're trying to produce. So if you're in a lab, you you should be able to answer that question. And it shouldn't be a technical answer. It shouldn't be uh, what I'm trying to do is produce this protein. Or what I'm trying to do is, you know, PCR this product. It should be something conceptual. I'm trying to answer this question, and that is going to be the main part of your paper. And then you can, at, even at the beginning stages, it's going to look murkier, darkier, you know, like foggy. But you should be able to say, okay, if I, how will my paper look if I want to answer this? So how will figure one look? How will figure two look? How will figure three look? And that's going to help you determine what experiments are the most important ones. Because that, that will help you prioritize. Prioritize the now. This is what I mean by it's a fluid structure because uh, for, for two reasons. One of them is because if you can write the paper before doing the experiments, maybe you're working in the wrong <laughs> in the wrong area. Okay, like you should you should be working on something where the experiments are actually necessary for writing the paper, where the experiments change the way you're thinking about the problem. Okay, so the, the experiments should be confirming what you're thinking about. I mean, there, there should be some surprises, right? Uh, that's why we do experiments. So, so I so I refer to it as fluid because it's going to change depending on what the data says. That's one. I also refer to it as fluid because there are different ways of writing a paper. Like we just had a discussion a second ago. Uh, this student that was asking like. I think it was Marcos Javier was asking about, do you, you know, you write the short paper, you write the longer paper. That's an example of how you can write two different papers with the same piece of data. 
but there are many other examples. You can you can order it in many different ways to put to place emphasis in different discoveries, and that 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 comes you know that comes with experience because that comes with the experience of what you think is the more interesting time of the things that you discover, and and that's what it that's why it's fluid, so it's going to change. But the fact that it's going to change doesn't mean that you you shouldn't have an idea of what it is today, and I think. Um, I, I trained with a person that requests that every project, she never talked about projects, my advisor. She's actually now the provost that do. She was very successful, became the provost. And she never talked about projects. She talked about papers. It's your first year in her lab. So she was a rotation student. You will go into her office and she will ask you, what paper are you working on right now? And you will have to describe your project like a paper. Like, I'm working on this paper, I'm working on that paper. And that's how you separate the stories, too. Because otherwise you got confused. You're like, okay, I'm working on 17 stories. The, the thing with papers to realize is, like, they're, they're like, like writing a book, okay? So let's suppose you're an author, and you write chapter one of, a, of one novel, and chapter two of, an, of one of another novel, and chapter one of another novel, and you write 37 chapters like that. But they're all chapter ones of different novels. You don't have any novel written. No one is going to buy them. No one is going to publish them. But if you write 37 chapters or even 10 chapters of a single novel, somebody's going to publish that. So you need to understand how these things go together. You need to color within the lines. If you're coloring all over the place, you might use a lot of paint, but you're not coloring a picture. Any other, anything else to add? My whole computer just crashed and I oh, just no. came I just came back online. Oh no. So I just say what Danielle said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um let's see, Carolina. I think that the, 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 the question about how we write papers, uh, I think it's very important to me because this is something that we um, are not so, or don't receive a lot of training on it. We just learn it by doing it. And um, in, in social sciences or in social work, we do have um, a lot of qualitative research. And um, I was wondering if one of you have experience in writing papers that come from the, from qualitative data. I mean, the concepts and the categories um, emerge from from the interviews, from field notes, from photographs. Depends on the method you use to get that qualitative data. Anyone had any have any experience? So can you tell us a bit more, Carolina? So in the chat you were talking about the figures being equivalent to stories. So I don't know enough about qual I mean I I've I guess I only have written one paper that kind of felt falls in that um category of being more qualitative and, and descriptive. Of, of something so can you tell us a bit more from what we've been discussing like what are maybe what are the biggest differences or what are you struggling the most with i think that um the the figures in in quantitative papers come from the statistical whatever values you do and i think I, that makes sense and it, it's i think uh makes sense to look at those figures and to kind of like write the results based on your question and how you run your statistics. Um, so thinking about that kind of like order, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe the stories of the interviewers are, are figures and then based on those stories you would arm your paper. But I was wondering if, if the panelists have experience with, with writing these kind of papers. So I'll just say I have no experience writing or reading those kinds of papers, but I would imagine that making an outline and having that flow coherently prior to writing the full paper still applies here, even if that's not preceded by or it's not followed by figure construction. I mean, the closest thing I can think of is writing review papers for for my field where, uh, you know, we're writing about what trends are in other people's data and what's the bigger picture and, and where we need to um, 
engage the field, uh, and then making figures to describe ideas, you know, that's a little bit more, um, takes a little bit of creative license, right? Um, things like flow charts or, uh, so that's, that's the closest I've, I can get to that. And usually that starts with um, a need, uh, what, what needs to be said, what, what's interesting, um, what's the point of the review paper, um, how do I want to influence the field? It's not just a book report, right? You want to you want to say something with it. So I think that is related to what we've been saying. You know, what is it that you want to say? What's your title? Or for me, what's your what's your abstract? Um, and then you know, what would some of those figures be? Um, and then an outline, of course, for for how that that might flow, topic sentences, and so on. Yes. Um, Daniel, do you have any thoughts? No, I, I, I haven't written papers like that, but I would imagine that, I mean, uh, I would imagine this is not a new problem. So I would imagine that anthropological papers probably will have the same problem or uh, soci sociological papers. I will, look, I will look at those, for example, in terms of how they represent the data, how they how they describe it, how they prepare the figures. I'll try to find some sort of, uh, I will reach out to the potential mentors or even just like look online for papers that, um, that represent anecdotes, you know, and, and how do they, how they quantify that, how, how do they, they have to be a lot of papers, like in the clinical sciences, things like that, they have to be a lot of papers like that. New England Journal of Medicine probably have papers like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, yeah I, uh, any, any of our fellows, do you have experience writing any of these qualitative papers? I mean, yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, I don't, ha I certainly don't have the experience, but I think you know, when I, I think of, of a scholarly piece of work, you know, I, I think a lot of what we've said um, and, and what the panelists have shared probably holds true across a variety of fields. It's like, you know, what's your idea? What's your contribution to, to the field? What is it, what is it that you want to say um, with, and you know, what are, what are the, the take home messages from, from the observations, the qualitative observations um, that you've made, but from the interviews that you made, you know, what's the story that you want to tell and, and how is it going to advance knowledge in, in, in your field? How is it going to change um, your field when you put that your work and, and the knowledge that you've created out there, like how is it going to change your field? And so how do you tell um, that story? Let's see. Sorry, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I don't know if you're... Yes, you... we can see you. Okay. Um, so I only have experience with mixed methods, like in uh, behavioral in in psychology, we do a lot of uh, a lot, you can do a lot of mixed methods. You have um, not only quantitative data, for example, if we administer like a Beck depression inventory, for example, but we we can also um, and this is for so that like a lot of like my fellows have a better idea, understanding of what qualitative can be. Um, but like if we want to get in depth. Like, for example, I'm studying a specific community, for example, um, trans men, for example. And this is like, and <laughs> Kimberly will, who's in my, uh, who's in my class, uh, will know what I'm talking about. Um, for example, if I'm studying like a certain uh, uh, population, community or something. Population. Like, a population. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I want to see if there's a higher prevalence of depression, while well, I administer that, that uh, quantitative thing, right, the, the inventory, and that's my quantitative data, yeah. but if I want to know more about their problems and what can uh, lead to that depression and whatnot, I will, uh, I will do uh, interviews, and they can be, they can be structured, or they can be, um, 
less structured and basically what we want is to get like the their experiences and see how they coincide and that way we can have a little bit more of an understanding and from there we can we can study like even more we can see how we can implement more quantitative or sorry quantitative at word um methods you know what i mean so and, and i agree with with what you're saying we're basically and actually taking that class right now um it basically the papers basically follow the same the same uh structure just a bit like it's a bit less um it's a bit more flexible but it's basically the same structure yeah <laughs> thank you Rocio. um okay let's see priscilla yeah hi um, so I've had this conversation with other professors and um, other grad students, but I've heard different opinions and I just want to hear your opinion on it. Um, so when do I have the conversation with my PI about the authors that should uh, be included in the paper? And I am aware that some journals uh, have specific guidelines on who should, who can be an author. Um, but I just want to hear your opinion as to when should I have that conversation and, and how is that process, how does that happen? Uh, how are the authors established? Uh, so I have that conversation at the very beginning. Um, and that doesn't mean that those authors are solidified and their order is solidified, but I find that it, um, it helps uh, guard against issues later on. And uh, yeah, I couldn't, I don't know if Danielle and Masha, if you guys would agree with this, but uh, it's, it's helped me tremendously since I started uh, my graduate career to try to organize the authors up front. Um, now, granted, when we have, say, undergraduates or other people, um, you know, come and contribute something that's worthy of authorship, then usually they get added on in some way, shape or form. Uh, so there's that, but definitely at the beginning, we try to see, you know, who's leading this project um, and, and who's going to be the main leader, who's going to write it, and so on. I, I agree. The sooner the better. I, the question you're asking, though, just so you're aware, I think it doesn't have it has general guidelines but it's not on the same way in every lab and even different different disciplines have different ways of ordering authors like there's some disciplines where the last author is the senior author there are other disciplines where the first author is the senior author i mean it just it varies so it's good to be clear about i think it, it, it's good to have that conversation and maybe have it not about other people but about yourself but you want to know where you are and what your role is in the paper i think that's what's important i I have a policy in my lab that I, as the principal investigator, I decide authorships, and that's that. I I uh, I welcome input. I listen to people. I listen to their concerns. I explain my decisions. But I'm but I'm very clear with anyone joining the lab that the final say in terms of authorships is is mine. And the reason I do that is because I don't want there I don't want there to be any competition between the people in the lab or any misunderstanding about uh, any joking like which I've seen in other places about uh, about authorships so I and the way that I feel that I can be clearest about that is by saying look it's it, 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 at the end it's my decision it's not this person's decision or that person's decision and I think I think in practice that's where it, how it works in all labs really like the PI at the end is the one that decides sometimes they just acquiesce to something, but at the end it's their decision, it's their responsibility. So the reason I say that is because you might want to approach the principal investigator that you're working with and just kind of have a clear conversation about what your role should be and what you hope your expectations are. I think particularly for Hispanic students, that's an important conversation to have. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's more likely that that um, like white males are more kind of aggressive or assertive, how why they need, what where they need to be in the authorship 
least than than women or minorities. So I think it's something to be aware of, and it's important to to make your your expectations clear in a friendly and polite way, but make them make them clear and and um, and do it as soon as possible. After, but after talking about design, not before talking about design. After talking about design. Does anybody have suggestions as to how to approach this conversation? Like, you know, I know some, I've been in labs where basically the policy has been, you know, if you contribute a figure to the paper, you're going to be an author. And of course, depending on how much you've contributed experimentally, that's going to determine, you know, what your order is. Um, but, you know, this, this, I know that this can be a difficult conversation to have um, so how do you make the argument like you know I should be I mean if it's your graduate project and it's your main project it should be a no-brainer that you're gonna be a first author but sometimes they're co-first authors so, so what are some strategies to approach that conversation can you hear me yes okay so I was just writing in the chat and you just asked the question so <laughs> Um, so it just happened to me, actually, there is a member from my lab that he likes to be in everybody's paper. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter that he has like three or four things going on. He wants to be in everybody's paper and he barely does something. Right. And since I'm very straightforward and I say things, how I am feeling them or I thinking, I just told him just, uh, clean and simple. If you're not gonna uh, um, compromise to do this experiment with me your name is not going to be there and uh, I even talked to my boss about it and I said look uh, very respectfully I talked to him I don't like this attitude from him and if he doesn't contribute he's not he's not going to be in my paper and he agree and and I think the most important thing is to uh, express your post poster and how you're feeling you don't need to be disrespectful or anything. Just be firm on what you want and what you're thinking is fair. If you do, if you do the work, I don't have any problems in including you on my paper. But don't expect me to put you because you're handsome or you have a pretty face. You need to do something. And I think uh, having this conversation with him, he, he thanked me because he said, you know what? Nobody ever talked to me in this way. I said, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but that's the way I am. So I don't have any problems um, having contributions with you or working together, but you need to compromise because uh, I'm working very hard on this. So I think just being straightforward about things and just addressing the, the situation. Thank you, Luz. Um, anyone else? Um, Daniela and Becca, how do you handle those conversations in in your lab like or how have you handled those conversations as graduate students or or, or postdocs daniel go ahead uh, so i okay so the, uh, i'll first say from the graduate student point of view on how just give some advice on how you can approach the subject and i think actually uh I think even okay, so just taking a step back from the authorships. I think OPIs welcome a conversation about a paper. That's what we produce. So forget even even forgetting about authorships, if you have if you're starting to brainstorm about your paper, I encourage you to approach your once you have an outline or a topic or an idea or the abstract or whatever you like that general idea, approach your PI and that's what you know those weekly meetings or every other week meetings are for. And I think if they see that you're thinking about the paper, they're gonna welcome that. I don't think anyone would be like, whoa, why are you thinking about the paper? That would be, uh, I don't think they'll do that. Uh, you can say, you know, I know it's early, but I wanna start thinking about my paper. That shows that you've been proactive. I think they're gonna approach that with a lot of respect. Now, if you're at this stage of the authorship, there are two possibilities, I think, very broad possibilities. That you were approached with an idea of a paper or that you initiated a paper. Those are the two very broad possibilities. If you were approached with the idea of a paper, the person that approached you or your PI probably has an idea of the authorships. 
the way to approach that conversation is to say, I'm very excited to be part of this paper. I just want to have a better idea of what my role is. Here are the, this is how I'm visualizing my role. I'm visualizing, I am going to finish this experiment. These are going to be part of figure X and Y. And I was hoping, I, you know, I don't, I don't know the moving parts to this paper. Again, this is the scenario where you don't know the moving parts to the paper because you were approached. I don't know the, all the moving parts to this paper, but you know, I was hoping that contribution would be considered this. It would be considered middle authorship, or it would be considered co authorship, or whatever. And whatever. And because I'm learning, I would like to know um, how how you think about authorships and how you think about my contribution. And I think that's a very forward and respectful way of kind of approaching the, the authorship thing, particularly if you were if you were approached by somebody else to work on something specific having to do with the paper. If it's your paper, meaning you were the one that initiated the whole conversation, it should be pretty clear that it's your paper, but but if other people are participating in it, you can approach your PI and say, kind of a similar conversation, but focus on the other people. You can say, you know, I'm very excited that I'll be working with these other people. I looking forward to integrating their contributions to my work. I value them, but I want to understand what their roles are so that I can better manage these different parts that are going to be coming to my paper. I can also better understand my role. And, you know, this is my main thesis project. So, of course, I'm expecting to be first author. Uh, I, 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 I imagine these other contributions I consider X, middle authorships or whatever it is that you think. And then you let the person explain. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, the, your spheres of influence are limited. That's something important to recognize. Like you, you know, you have to, you have to pick your battles. Like I, I had a paper, um, I get, the best example I'll give is what my first paper, actually, my very first paper was a triple co-equal co first authorship. And I had what I consider was the most important experiment. So essentially I had an a discovery I had made which, uh, which somebody else has approached my advisor to put in their paper because they were going to publish it. And my advisor decided, no, you know what, we're going to publish it. And I was a new student, so I wasn't really sure about what I needed to do to publish it. So I was just kind of following her advice. She put two other more senior students in the paper, and then she decided she was going to make it into a co equal, triple first authorship. I, I, my understanding was that I was going to be second name. And I was I finished my experiments, I turned in all my experiments, I went to Puerto Rico for vacation for Christmas, I came back after this weekend, so when I came back I was the third author. And and then I went to her and I said, Why what's going on with this? And she she actually didn't wanna she was like, Oh, it's the decision of the other student that she didn't wanna she didn't wanna have to deal with with making the decision herself. So actually calling to the, the others, I was very, very respectful about this. Okay, this was a very delicate situation to navigate. But I was very, very respectful, but, but very clear. I was like, well, if it's the decision of the other student, let's bring in the other student into the office and have a conversation. So the other student came in, and then she actually, she actually just said, you know, I just think that you haven't been here for the past few weeks, and, like, and you know, the student has been working so hard. And now, and then I made my point. I said, look, I haven't been here for the past few weeks because I finished all my work and I went back to see my family. And I, you know, I, I put this paper, I, I finished all the results, blah, blah. And she said, you know, sorry, this is, this is just how it's going to be. And I said, okay. I didn't say anything else. I didn't say another word. She tried to get another word out of me. And I, used, I, was, I was upset, but I wasn't serious. I was just like, okay, I made my point. It's her decision. At the end of the day, it's her decision. Then uh, I, that wasn't my only paper. I got like three or four papers out of grad school. And then after... Uh, graduation, she came up to me and apologized for that decision. Like, and she said, you know, this is actually reflected in the in the recommendation letter. Not only the contribution that you made to that paper, the importance of the contribution, but also how you handle the situation. I I will argue that that recommendation letter helped me much more than being the second name of a triple co-equal first authorship. So you have to be, you know, this is not this this is not like going to a used cars like like a used uh, cars. Uh, dealership and trying to to buy like a used car and you're like you haggle and then it's like screw you screw you and you walk out it doesn't work that way so you have to navigate these situations carefully but you have to be clear respectful but clear that'll be my advice 
Great, Becca. Anything you want to add? Uh, you know, I I have quite a few stories, but I'm on the tenor track, and I hear that published. <laughs> so I'm just gonna uh, give some general advice that uh, yes. Yes, I absolutely respect when people come to me and talk about authorship. I think that's fantastic. Um, I actually try, I do bring it up um, because of the experiences, a lot of negative experiences I had coming up in academia. Um, I like to bring it up as soon as we get the idea out there, as soon as we storyboard the idea, you know, this is your project or this is my project, but you're going to play a significant role in it. Uh, so as a PI, I, I like to do that and I like to do it in a way that's really positive positive. Um, but not all PIs are like that. Uh, not all collaborators are like that. So I think you have to um, be prepared. Uh, and especially again, you know, if you're, if you're from, if you're a woman or if you're Latinx, you know, uh, I think there's data to show that um, we generally get bumped down a little bit more than our, than our, uh, than say a white male. Um, so it, it can be a hard conversation to have. And, uh, and I, you know, be really uncomfortable, but I think it's necessary. And I think to try to get your foot in the door at the beginning um, is, is really important and to keep, you know, reaffirming uh, that your role in the particular project. Now, I, I actually hate talking about authorship because all I wanna do is good science. I hate that kind of political crap, but, um, it's true, you need to, if it's yours, you, you deserve the credit. Or if you worked on something, if you spent time on something, you deserve the credit. So these are important uh, conversations to have. And I think they become easier uh, after you force yourself to start having the first few of them. Yes, that is, that's great. I mean, and I think, I don't know, I, I think it's never too early to have these conversations. I mean, we, we mentioned it earlier, labs have their own policies and it's different but i mean i think you know for if if you feel like well it's still too early i i know um i and i want to res be respectful of our panelists time because we're just um at at 5 30 or 8 30 for those of you on the east coast so i want to be respectful and this is um the last thing i'll, I'll say you know i think if you feel that it may be too early because I just started this lab, I just started this project, I think it's at least important to get clarity on what the policy is. Like, how do these conversations usually go in the lab? Um, and, and, you know, this is obviously not, not always a straightforward conversation, but if it is a, a conversation that you feel comfortable with having with your PI right away, I would have it right away with your PI, but also talk to other people in the lab that have been there for a while, that have already published in the lab. And, you know, how does that, how was that process? Um, you know, that may be a question that you want to ask for before joining a lab. Um, if you, you know, if you can still, um, you know, if you can still make, if you're still making that decision of, of joining a lab. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a, it's an area where, there can be unfortunately a lot of conflict at times um, with authorship and so on, and, and you wanna definitely avoid that. But it's also an area, particularly if you wanna go into an academic path, it's an area that is very, very important, you know? And so, you know, if, for those of you who are interested in going in academia, you're gonna need that first author paper. And so that's something that, that it, I think it's an important conversation. Um, to have. Um, so as I said, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank Rebecca, Daniel, and Masha again for, for their time, for, for their insights, and, and for, their, for their contributions. Um, you've been supremely helpful um, to us tonight. Um, so that is, I'm going to stop recording. That's